welcome back, everybody. Um, we're next hopping on a time machine across the globe to take you back to 19th century America. Tom Smith and Hilary Emmett are going to talk to us about what the first Christmas tree in America looked like, the different outfits gift givers would wear, and my personal favourite, festive food. So, over to you, Hilary and Tom. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Professor Thomas Roy Smith. And I'm Dr. Hilary Emmett. And today, we're going to transport you to a time and place where Christmas often looked very different than it does today. We're going to be talking to you about what it was like to be a child at Christmas time in 19th century America. And that is something that we know a bit about. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been teaching a class where we explore the history of children's literature. But at the same time as doing that, our students work with the UEA Publishing Project to produce new editions of classic 19th century American books for children. Uh, and so far, we've published new editions of Susan Coolidge's What Katie Did and Margaret Sidney's Five Little Peppers. And our students wrote a new introduction for these books, and they helped design the covers, and they, we think they did a pretty great job. Now, we noticed that these books shared something in common. In both of them, the characters celebrate Christmas. So here on your screen, you see an extract from What Katie Did, which was written in 1873. And in this book, I don't think this is giving too much away, Katie has had a terrible accident. She's injured herself and she has to lie flat on her back in her bedroom for four years from when she's 12 years old. So in this little moment in the novel, all of her siblings, she's got lots of little brothers and sisters, have prepared a surprise Christmas for her. But what was that strange thing beside the bed? Katie stared and rubbed her eyes. It certainly hadn't been there when she went to sleep. How had it come? It was a little evergreen tree planted in a red flower pot. The pot had stripes of gilt paper stuck on it and gilt stars and crosses, which made it look very gay. And the boughs of the tree were hung with oranges and nuts and shiny red apples and popcorn balls and strings of bright berries. There were also a number of little packages tied with blue and crimson ribbon. And altogether, the tree looked so pretty that Katie gave a cry of delighted surprise. And this is an extract from Five Little Peppers. Now, at this point in the story, uh, the Pepper family, there's five, five siblings, they're very poor, and they've never actually celebrated Christmas before. So on this Christmas morning, they are very excited to wake up and find that their stockings are full. So, Merry Christmas, oh, Ben and Joel and Davy. Oh, 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 and then the sounds that answered her as with smothered whoops of expectation, they one and all flew into their clothes. Quick as a flash, Joel and Davy were down and dancing around the chimney. Mammy, Mammy, screamed Phronsie, hugging her stocking, which Ben lifted her up to unhook from the big nail. Santy did come, he did. And then she spun around in the middle of the floor, not stopping to look in it. And if you want to know more about the Peppers and their Christmas adventures, there are copies for sale in the lobby at very reasonable prices. So uh, have a look for those later. But these certainly weren't the only American children's book from this period to feature Christmas. The more we looked, the more Christmases we found. You might have heard of a book called Little Women, by Louisa May Alcott, which has been made into a movie a number of times. And it was first published in 1868, and it begins with one of the most famous lines in children's literature. And in this story, the children's father is away in the Civil War. And so again, they're struggling to celebrate Christmas. It doesn't feel very Christmassy, and they don't have very much Christmas for presents. And this book begins with, Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe lying on the rug. But another thing we noticed about these books was that while these Christmases could look very familiar, the way that Americans celebrated Christmas in the 19th century could also look quite strange to us today. People brought their Christmas traditions to America from all over the world. As Harper's Weekly put it in 1870, From every nation we seem to have gathered some special custom and uniting all together celebrate our American Christmas. So today, we're going to explore what it meant to celebrate Christmas as a child in 19th century America, since the 1800s. So we're going to witness the unveiling of the first Christmas tree in America, meet a weird and wonderful assortment of Christmas visitors, and then tuck in to some tantalizing Christmas treats. And if we're lucky, we might get to meet a very special visitor. So 
Let's begin. Now, how many of you have already put your Christmas tree up? Ooh. Yeah. OK, pretty solid. Good work, everybody. But have you ever wondered when we started dragging trees into our houses and decorating them with glittery objects? People will often tell you that it was Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, who first invented the Christmas tree in England. This picture of the royal Christmas tree at Windsor Castle was published in 1848. And so the story goes that from that point up onwards, everyone in the UK simply had to have one. Well, Prince Albert might have helped to make them popular, but he certainly didn't invent them. People have been decorating Christmas trees since around the 1500s, in Germany anyway. And today, we're not going to go back that far, but we are going back further in time than 1848. We are going back to 1835. We're going to America, and we're traveling in the company of one of the most famous writers ever to come from Norwich. So this is Harriet Martineau. And she was born in Norwich in 1802. And in the 1830s, she became a very famous writer. So she did what a number of famous writers did at this point, and that was visit America. So she was interested to see what life was like on the other side of the Atlantic. And she was pretty sure she could write a popular book about her adventures in the New World when she came back. Now, as it happened, she stayed there for almost two years and wrote two popular books about everything she did in America. And as luck was ha would, would have it, while she was celebrating the Christmas season in Boston in 1835, she got to experience something very special. While she was visiting her friend, Charles Follen, and he was an academic at Harvard University, he'd just come over to America from Germany to teach German there, she saw what is often thought to be the very first Christmas tree in America. So this is what she says. She says, I was present at the introduction into the new country of the spectacle of the German Christmas tree. And even more luckily for us, she wrote a detailed description of it. And here it is. OK, you're right. No whooping. It doesn't look very impressive at the moment. And that's because, of course, it needs to be decorated. And that's exactly the situation that Harriet Martineau found when she arrived at Charles Follen's house in 1835. The tree needed to be decorated. And Harriet had a very particular job to do while the tree was being decorated. So she wrote, it had been settled that in order to cover our design, so to keep the Christmas tree secret from all the children in the house, I was to resume my vocation of teaching Christmas games after tea while Charlie's mother, so Charlie's, Charles Follen's son, and her maids went to light up the front room. So all found seats, many of the children on the floor, for Old Coach. Old Coach? What's that? We wondered the same thing. So we did some research, that's what we do at universities, and as luck would have it, we found it in the rules of this book. Published in 1835, the same year that Harriet was teaching it to the young Americans in Charles Follen's house. And here's what it said. The children were desired to sit around in a circle and each to choose some part of a carriage to represent. The lady then said she would stand in the middle and tell them a story about the old coach in which she would endeavour frequently to introduce by name its different parts. And if, during the recital, any person on mention of the part which he or she represented should fail instantly to get up, turn around completely and sit down again, that person would be liable to a forfeit. Every time the old coach itself should be mentioned, the whole party must turn around. So you know what that means. It's time for a serious historical, historical reenactment. Re yes. While Santa's little helpers decorate this Christmas tree just as it was decorated in 1835 at Charles Follen's house, we are going to play the game of old coach for the first time in perhaps almost 200 years. Uh, and for that part of things, we're going to need some volunteers. We need five, five volunteers, volunteers who are going to come and play old coach. All right, we had quick as a flash here in the Christmas tree jumper. Um, and this person who's almost leaping out of their Doctor Who shirt, I think, come on down. And maybe someone from a bit further up the back. There's a little person in a black shirt just on the aisle just there who's got their hand up. Yeah, you've just put your hand down. Brilliant. Come down. Um, and there in the blue jumper with the beanie. 
And maybe a grown-up. Grown Do we have a brave grown-up who would like to be <laughs> involved? Who's going to volunteer Someone's a parent? Someone's being volunteered there. What do we think? Oh, yeah, I've got three people putting... No, they're shaking their heads. All right. Um, yep, this lady just okay, here. Go, Thank you. Good. Come on down. Okay, well done. Round of applause for our volunteers, I think. <laughs> we, um... We'll introduce those one at a time. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to play Old Coach, but actually we thought we'd make it a bit more festive today, and we've called it The Old Sleigh, exactly. right? So each of you, our brave volunteers, are going to represent a different part of Santa's sleigh. And then we are going to read a story about The Old Sleigh, and when we mention the name of your part, you have to jump up, turn around, sit down again. And when we say the phrase, the old sleigh, you all have to jump up, turn around, sit down again. Okay? So, first, our first volunteer, you are going to be Santa's sack. All right. Here we go. Very good. It's going to be the sack. Oh, sack. Okay, good. Right. Next, we're going to have the reins of Santa's sleigh. Here we go. You are the reins. Uh, next, we're going to have the reindeer, a crucial element. Oh, oh, this one's pretty good. You get to wear the reindeer horns. Is that comfy? Yeah. Yep, great. Uh, next up, we're going to have the sleigh bells. Interactive. And finally, we're going to have the seat of Santa's sleigh. OK, here we go. I think we should have a test run, probably, to make sure we all know what we're doing. So when I say sack, up you get, spin around, sit down, very good. When I say reins, yep, brilliant, excellent. Reindeer, fabulous. Bells, give them a jingle. Give them a jingle. Yep. And seat, Woo. smashing. And finally, the old sleigh. Yeah, that's going to catch you out, that one. Brilliant. Okay, very good, very good, very good. Okay, so we're all ready. OK, it's time for the old sleigh. History is being made. Off we go. Ooh. It was Christmas Eve, and Santa's workshop was abuzz with excitement. The presents had all been wrapped and placed in Santa's sack. The reindeer had been fed and watered. All that was left was to get the old sleigh ready for action. Each year, Jingles the Elf had the great responsibility of making sure that the old sleigh was in good working order and looking its best. There were many things that he had to consider. First, he had to make sure that the seat was plump and comfortable. Then he had to check that the reins were safe and secure, secure. Then he had to polish the sleigh bells, check that the sack didn't have any holes in it, and make sure that the reindeer knew the way. Yes, taking care of the old sleigh was one of the most important jobs in all of the North Pole. But oh dear, horror spread across poor Jingle's face as he watched his best friend Bauble slowly push the old sleigh out of the barn. The old sleigh, the old sleigh had never looked worse. The seat was mouldy and mice had eaten its stuffing. The bells were looking tarnished and had lost their jaunty jingle. The reins had perished and broken and the sack was threadbare. Santa wouldn't be happy if he saw his old sleigh looking like this and neither would the reindeer. <laughs> Blitzen trotted up to Jingles to tell him in no uncertain terms that if the old sleigh wasn't looking its best soon, all of the reindeer, the reindeer, <laughs> were going on strike. Come on, baubles, Jingles announced. We need to get this old sleigh ready to roll. And we'd better be quick about it. You heard the reindeer. In the next hour, we need to fix the seat, darn the sack, polish the bells, repair the reins, and make sure the reindeer are happy. And then, and only then, will the old sleigh be fit for Santa. Baubles and Jingles jumped to it. First, Baubles stuffed the stuffing back into the seat. Then he darned the sack with his needle and thread. That's the seat and the sack done, he cried. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jingles had also been busy. The bells were already sparkling, and the glue was almost dry on the reins. Bells and reins are also ready, he shouted to Baubles. Let's get the reindeer over for an inspection of the old sleigh. <laughs> Blitzen brought over the rest of the reindeer. Well, Jingles, he said, I'm impressed. Earlier this evening, the seat, 
the bells, the sack, and the reins were all in a terrible state. We reindeer could never pull such a sad looking old sleigh. But you have done a wonderful job. Now, should we try and get everyone else to, to read along with us for this last one? Yep. Okay, we're improvising here, so good luck, everyone. <laughs> the reins, the, the bells, bells, the sack, sack and the seat are all looking, looking splendid. splendid. The, the reindeer, reindeer are happy, and, and the old sleigh is ready to go. go. Hooray, hooray for jingles, jingles and baubles, and, and hooray, hooray for the old sleigh. Okay, thank you very much, volunteers. That was very good. Outstanding work. Well done. So you just made history there. The old coach revived. Who's, who's going to be playing that on Christmas Day? That'll keep oh, you, that'll keep you busy. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everybody. You can take your seats again. There we go. Very well done. Very well done. Good job. Okay. So Santa's little helpers have been busy, and it is now time for the big reveal. Ready, everybody? Ooh. Ooh. Magical. <laughs> okay, so immediately we can see that this Christmas tree looks pretty familiar to us, but it also has some differences to the trees that you might have in your homes today. Um, so what exactly did Harriet and her friends put on this tree in 1835? Well, what does she tell us? She tells us that there were gilt egg cups and gay paper cornucopiae with confits, lozenges, and barley sugar. So how many people have got eggs on their Christmas tree at home? Okay, well, oh yeah, okay, some of you have, that's good, that's good. So yeah, so eggs, golden eggs, and um, paper cones filled with sweets. But I bet some of you have got chocolates on your tree. Yeah, so not that different, okay. Uh, next up, smart dolls and other whimsies glittered in the evergreen. We have a, a UEA rabbit, that's uh, appropriate. Um, so yes, yeah, so at this point, people would often put their presents in the branches of the trees, um, not underneath them. So you'd, you'd come up to the tree and you'd, you'd pick your present from the tree. So it's a bit different. And finally, of course, the big difference is seven dozen wax tapers, so real candles in 1835. Um, you to use your imagination slightly today. Uh, imagine these are real candles. Um, and of course, that's the way that people lit up their Christmas trees for most of the 19th century until electricity was invented and then enough, enough people's homes to actually uh, uh, make Christmas lights. Uh, at some points in the 19th century, people had gas-powered Christmas trees, which sounds very exciting, if not uh, a bit dangerous. And to be fair, it was probably a, a good thing that health and safety didn't, didn't let us put real candles on the tree today. Because on the one hand, it would have looked nice, what does Harriet say? It really looked beautiful, but it did. The room seemed in a blaze and the ornaments were so well hung on it that no accident happened. Except there was one mishap. One doll's petticoat caught fire. Uh, but luckily, as you can see, there was a sponge tied to the end of a stick to put out any supernumerary blaze and no harm ensued. So even then, the, you know, you have to be health and safety conscious. Um, all in all, Harriet thought, I have little doubt that the Christmas tree will become one of the most flourishing exotics of New England. So she thought Christmas trees were probably going to be a popular thing. And of course, she was correct. Uh, but the next time that someone tells you that Prince Albert invented the Christmas tree, you can tell them that Harriet Martineau from Norwich in Boston in 1835 got there first. So, that's the Christmas tree. Okay, the tree's up, but now we need some presents to put underneath it. But that means we need someone to bring them. Oh, oh, oh. oh my goodness. This is good timing. It's Father, it's Father Christmas. Christmas. Let's give Father Christmas a big <laughs> welcome, everybody. Look at this. Come on down, Father Christmas. I'm glad to see my elves have been helpful. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Father Christmas. Father Christmas. Here's a microphone for you. Thank you. Oh. It's lovely to see you, but, but what are you doing here, Father Christmas? Aren't you meant to be getting ready for the big day? Well, that's true, but I'm having a bit of a wardrobe crisis. I don't know what to wear. But, Father Christmas, you wear the same thing every year, don't you? In fact, it was the 19th century American illustrator, Thomas Nast, who helped design your iconic outfit. Well, that's very true. He did capture my likeness really well, but... I'm just a bit bored of the red suit. 
Have you got any ideas? Well, we can help you there because children in 19th century America had a lot of different beliefs about who it was exactly who brought them their presents on Christmas morning. Oh, People really? came to America from all over the world and brought their Christmas traditions with them. Oh, really? Yes, Ooh. Father Christmas. Not everyone hung up their stockings for you, you know. Oh. So why don't we tell everybody here about some of the other famous gift bringers from 19th century America, <laughs> and you can see if they're going to provide you with any fashion inspiration. What do you think? Mm, that sounds like a good idea. I'm looking okay. forward to this. Well, we've, got, we've got, some, got some outfits ready, so this is, uh, this is very lucky. It is time for a serious historical, historical fashion, fashion show. show. Ooh. Ooh, okay, right. So, Father Christmas, first up, we have Bell Snickle. So, Bell Snickle came to America from Germany, and he was particularly, particularly popular amongst children in Pennsylvania when he visited them on Christmas Eve. So, here he is, he's looking devilishly handsome, as you can see, in a furry coat. Furry coat, smashing. furry coat. Now, and he always accessorised that perfectly with his trademark whip and sack. Oh, hang on. Whip's a bit tangled on the coat hanger. Uh, How's whip? that? Give it a try, what do you think? <sighs> he looks a bit dowdy. Mm -hmm. What's the whip for? Is that, it's not for the reindeer. No, 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 that's oh. for the children. The children? <laughs> yes, Father Christmas, that's for the naughty children. He whips them. That's terrible. And what about the sack? Is that for the presents? Well, it is for the presents, but it's also for the naughtier children. The, the naughtier children? I yes, Santa. I didn't think these children would fit in this sack. Yeah, he kidnaps them, he stuffs them in his sack, and he takes them away from their long-suffering parents. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> OK, so, so here's, here's a description of Bell Snickle from a, from a children's magazine in 1849. So this is Bell Snickle talking. You know, I go into a great many families and see a variety of children. It's my way to tell them their faults, if they have any, and most children have, and give them a bit of advice. I always shake my stick before I put my hand into my bag. Come here, Master Gerald. Do you shovel the snow for your mother and do all her errands willingly and hang up your cap and study your lessons? And are you kind to your sisters? Don't run away, Susie, it's your turn. So what do you think, Father Christmas? Are you going to swap to Bell Snickle's outfit? Well, regardless of the parents' reaction, I think that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you must have something else. OK, OK, don't panic, don't panic, Father Christmas. Oh. Let's see next? what we can do. Oh. OK, here we have the elegant Chris Kindle. The Chris Kindle also came to America from Germany and sports an angelic outfit, perfect for delighting children on Christmas Eve. Sometimes children believe that the Chris Kindle visited in the company of Bell Snickle <laughs> in a kind of good cop, bad cop situation. You may not think you've heard of the Chris Kindle, but you may recognise their influence on one of Father Christmas's nicknames, Chris Kringle. And here's a poem about the Chris, King Chris Kindle written by a German American in the 19th century. Sorry, Tom. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now, I am not going to bust out my GCSE level German. Um, but luckily, we have a translation. Oh, your yeah, next one. Father Christmas Day, uh, Christmas Day is here again. The children are all jumping around and seem very happy. They hope that the Chris Kindle leaves lots of things in the stockings that are hanging. So, Father Christmas, do you think that this would suit you? I think it looks a bit breezy. <laughs> I think it might be a bit too chilly for the sleigh. Mm, okay. okay, no problem. All right, we've got another one. Don't worry. Um, all the way from Italy, here's the Fanna. She's looking gorgeously gloomy with her dark robes, her witch's hat, mm. and of course, her broom. So the story goes that Befana was visited by the wise men when they were on their way to Bethlehem. Um, they wanted to know which, which way to go, so she gave them directions and they asked her to go with them. But she said she was too busy sweeping her house. But she immediately regretted it. And from that point forward, she wanders the world, giving presents to young children to make up for missing the first Christmas. And here's a, a child's description of their Italian-American Christmas in 19th century America in Iowa. 
So she said, my father would go to the city for Christmas shopping, but he's paid, he's not allowed to buy very much. The night before Christmas, he would hang it up for us, brightly colored knitted stockings made by our grandmother and brought to America by another villager. On Christmas morning, the Bafana had left each of us a 10 cent toy, an orange, a Hershey almond bar, and a pair of stockings or some much needed garment. Sometimes there would be chestnuts. This one might work, Father Christmas, don't you think? They look a bit spooky. <laughs> And I'm not sure the broomstick would work instead of the sleigh. There'd be nowhere to put the presents. There must be something else. OK, we do have one more option to show you. Oh, flick is there. Here we have the rather warmer weather stylings of John Canoe. A net and ribbons accompanied by cow's horns. John Canoe came to America, for America from the Bahamas and was a popular figure for enslaved people in North Carolina. And here's a description from Harriet Jacobs, who herself escaped from slavery before writing about her life and her experiences. Every child rises early on Christmas morning to see the John Canoes. Without them, Christmas would be shorn of its greatest attraction. They consist, they consist of companies of slaves from the plantations. Two athletic men in calico wrappers have a net thrown over them, covered with all manner of bright colored stripes. Cows' tails are fastened to their backs and their heads are decorated with horns. A box covered with sheepskin is called the gumbo box and a dozen beat on this while others strike triangles and jawbones to which bands of dancers keep time. For a month previous, they're composing songs which are sung on this occasion. So there we go, Father Christmas. What do you think? Giving you four smashing new choices. I'm not very sure about what this. Do you, what do you think, audience? Do you think Father Christmas should change his outfit? Yeah. Oh. Okay, so... All those in favour of a change, shout yes. Yeah. Yes, all right, yes. All those who think that Father Christmas should stick with his trademark cosy red and white, can you give us a no? No. All those who said yes, say yes again. <laughs> oh, no, I won't. <laughs> I think I'm going to stick with the old red suit that everybody knows. And if you come and find me or my elves after the lecture, you may have a little gift. Oh, exciting. OK, thank you, Father Christmas. Thank you very much. We'll see you later, Father Christmas. Thank you, Father Christmas. Alright. Okay, there he goes. Yeah, make sure you find him later. Oh, you've still got your horns. Oh, not the horns. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, the tree is up. We've got plenty of gift bringers to bring the presents, but... We need something to eat. Oh, I hope there'll be mince pies and Christmas ham. What's your favourite Christmas food, Tom? Uh, Christmas pudding and Christmas cake, of course. <laughs> Does anyone else have a favourite Christmas food? All right, here in the pink with the bear. Pigs in blankets, good choice. Here with those spotty arms. Oh, it's Doctor Who again, yep. Oh, what, darling? Chips. Chips. Excellent. Chips are great all year round, I think. Up the back in the sparkly reindeer, the red with the sparkly reindeer. Could you shout? Maybe get mum or dad to shout out for you. Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts, Very good. love it. Um, what about down here in the leopard print? Chocolate, chocolate log. Mm, nice. Oh, are you? Oh, nice. Definitely. Okay, we'll take one more right up the back in an orange top, orange jacket. Um, Mince pies, person after my own heart, absolutely. So, now, can anyone think, what do all of these foods have in common? Things like mince pies, pigs in blankets, chocolate, sort of sweet treats, warm treats, what do they have in common? Yep, here in the grey. They're all sweet, yep, they're, they're sweet, they're sweet treats. Here in the jumper, yep. Sorry, no, this little one. Oh, either of you, yeah. They're cosy food. 
good. Nailed it. Very good. So these are all things that we eat when it's very cold outside. So warm mince pies, roast turkey, roast potatoes. They're absolutely delicious to fill up on when the weather is miserable. But I grew up in Australia, which can cause a little bit of an issue for some of these Christmassy foods. So we're going to take a teeny detour to the Southern Hemisphere to consider what Christmas might have been like in 19th century Australia before whisking you back across the Pacific for a particularly North American treat. So can anyone tell me what the weather is like in Australia at Christmas? All right, in the blue T-shirt over here. You seem dressed for an Australian Christmas. Is that too much of a clue? What? At 40 degrees, it can be 40 degrees. It's very, very hot. That's right. So can anyone tell me what season it is in Australia right now? Um, up the back on the left here, I can see a red arm. I can't even see your face, but... <laughs> summer. Summer, that's absolutely right. So, yeah. Um, so it's summertime. So what kinds of Christmassy foods do you think people might like to eat in Australia in the summertime? Yep, Mickey Mouse? Barbecue. Barbecue, love it. Yep, down here. You don't know. That's <laughs> it's turkey. Excellent. So we've got barbecue. That's right. Up the back, just up here. Pigs and blankets. Pigs and blankets. And we, are, we tend actually not to eat pigs and blankets so much in Australia, but we definitely have barbecues. So up here. Yep. What was that? Pork. 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 Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, these are all things that we might eat. And I'll take one more. There's right up the back. You've got something in your hand. Did you wave it? Fruit salad. Yep, fruit and salad. That's true. So often people in Australia have things like seafood and fruit and salad and barbecues and things that you do outside. But actually, a lot of people do have a very English roast dinner because a lot of the early settlers in Australia came from England and brought their traditions with them. In the 19th century, before the uh, invention of air conditioning, this made Christmas dinner a bit of an ordeal for the poor cooks tending the roast or boiling the pudding. And here's a few stanzas for a very famous Australian poem, A Bush Christmas, where the poet C.J. Dennis remembers the Christmases of his childhood at the end of the 19th century in Australia. And then, dishevelled, hot and red, can you imagine cooking a turkey <laughs> over a stove uh, you know, probably had a, you know, an actual fire raging in it in 40 degree heat. Mum through the doorway puts her head and says, This Christmas cooking, my, the sun's near fit for cooking by. Upon her word, she never did see such. Your fault, says Dad, you know it is plum pudding on a day like this and roasted turkey, spare me days. Can't get over women's ways in climates such as this, the thing's all wrong. The dinner's served for Biden's up. Come on, says Mum, now all sit up. The meal takes on a festive air, and even father eats his share and passes up his plate to have some more. So even though we did have those kinds of cold weather festive foods when I was a girl in Australia, I always felt it was never quite the same as having a chilly Christmas, like I'd read about in my favourite children's books, such as Little Women, What Katie Did and Five Little Peppers. Now, if you've read or seen Little Women, you'll know famously that the March sisters, seen here in the 2019 film of Little Women, give away their breakfast, which is muffins with cream and buckwheat pancakes, to a family who have fallen on hard times and are starving. In what Katie did, the children have oranges and nuts and shiny red apples and popcorn balls. And in the sequel, when Katie and her sister Clover go away to boarding school, they receive a Christmas box... The top of the box was mostly taken up with four square paper boxes, round which parcels of all shapes and sizes were wedged and fitted. Each box held a different kind of cake. One was of jumbles, another was of ginger snaps, a third of crullers, and the fourth contained a big square loaf of frosted plum cake with a circle of sugar almonds set in the frosting. How the trio exclaimed at this. So jumbles are apparently little round cakes that fit on your, on your finger like a ring and you can mm. kind of eat them, eat them off your finger like a ring. So I think plum cake and ginger snaps might be a bit more familiar. But the book that I returned to again and again was one that was set in the period we're talking about, the 1870s. It was written down a bit later on when the author, Laura Ingalls Wilder, remembered what it was like to grow up in a little house on the prairie. Because even though the weather was hot in Australia, we could still get some of those cold weather foods. 
But there was one thing we never had. Can you imagine what you, can, you cannot get in Australia in December? It's... No, it's, it's actually not a food. It's a weather-related thing. What do you think there might never be in Australia in December? Snow. Winter, yep, snow. So I heard someone call out snow. That's right. We could not get snow. So, um, so this passage in particular seemed magical. The syrup is waxing. Come and help yourselves. They all hurry to the kitchen for plates and outdoors to fill the plates with snow. Laura and all the other children scooped up clean snow with their plates. Then they went back into the crowded kitchen. Grandma stood by the brass kettle and with the big wooden spoon, she poured hot syrup on each plate of snow. It cooled into soft candy and as fast as it cooled, they ate it. They could eat all they wanted for maple sugar never hurt anybody. There was plenty of syrup in the kettle and plenty of snow outdoors. As soon as they ate one plate full, they filled their plates with snow again and grandma poured more syrup on it. So more than anything, I wanted to make maple syrup candy on a fresh plate of snow. But it turns out that's not just a challenge in Australia. Yes, despite the cold weather, there simply wasn't enough snow for us to do a live historical reenactment on the stage. However, we sent Santa's little helpers to the magical laboratories of UEA's new science building and set them the challenge of making snow candy in Norfolk. Yes, it is time for a serious historical reenactment that, that we made it. earlier. <laughs> so, this is what the elves needed. And this is what you would also need if you attempt to make maple syrup candy at home. As you'll see in the video, you may not want to try this at home. Uh, beware, things get very hot, so only attempt this in the company of a responsible adult or elf of your choice. But anyway, here's the ingredients we need. Some real maple syrup, of course. We need some wooden lolly sticks. A tray of clean, fresh snow or crushed ice. Uh, a saucepan or a small pot. And a confectionery thermometer. The method is deceptively simple. You pour the syrup into a small pot and you heat it up. You just keep boiling that syrup. Boiling and boiling and boiling. <laughs> And boiling. And boiling. And boiling. And, boiling. Uh, and you need to make sure it gets to 235 degrees Fahrenheit, that is. Then you take the pot from the heat and you pour your syrup in lines on the snow. And then you stick a lolly, lolly stick in it, roll it up, and you have your maple syrup, syrup candy ready to eat. Okay, so that was their mission. Shall we see how our elves got on? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, well, here we are. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So as you can see, first step, pour the syrup into a pot. Mission accomplished. And now, heat the syrup. Ever heard the saying, a watch pot never boils? That's what happens with maple syrup, syrup candy. Keep, keep boiling the syrup. <laughs> oh, something's happened. It's looking a bit bubbly. Not, not bubbly enough yet. Ah, something to do to pass the time. Preparing your tray of snow and or crushed ice. So pack it down really hard, we discovered. Ah, okay. This looks exciting. We, uh, we have, and here, look, here we are. The big moment, pouring the syrup on the snow. And there we have it. Look at that. Oh, maple syrup candy on a stick, triumph. Triumph for Santa's little helpers. Doesn't it look delicious? <laughs> well done, Santa's little helpers. Woo! Okay. Didn't they do well? Well done, well done. So it might not look very appetizing, and our helpers didn't quite manage the circles and curlicues and squiggly things you can see there in the illustration that Laura and her sister Mary made, but we are told that it was delicious. Luckily for you, our treasured guests, 
We purchased some maple syrup candy that's been made by professionals and not by the elves in the science labs. So you can have a proper taste of Christmas in 19th century America and you'll be able to pick that up in the lobby on your way out. Yeah, make sure you see Santa. That's what he's got yes. for you. So We'll finish uh, where we began with this quotation from Harper's Weekly in 1870. From every nation we seem to have gathered some special custom and uniting all together, celebrate our American Christmas. So children's experiences of Christmas in 19th century America were brought together from a wide variety of fascinating people and places. But so, when you think about it, are the ways that people celebrate Christmas today, whether those traditions come from Norfolk or New York or Australia, none of them are exactly alike. And of course, even though we've looked at the, at the specific tradition of Christmas, there are all kinds of ways to celebrate the end of the calendar year and see in the new one, whether that's in the depths of winter or the heights of summer. So whatever your decorations look like, whoever brings your presents, and whatever your favourite celebration foods are, we hope you have a wonderful festive season. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Elves, helpers, volunteers. Wasn't that brilliant? Thank you so much, Tom and Hilary. I'm now hungry for some maple syrup sweeties. So um, as, as Brianna said, make sure you grab one as you go out. Also outside, um, along with Father Christmas, we've got some more fossils and props from the previous lecture. So do have a look with a magnifying glass at what's on the table. Book bugs and dragon tails are still there, and we'd love to know what you thought about today. So do let us know. We've got a whiteboard which you can let us know about as well on, and um, grown-ups will be sending you an email to let us know what you thought about today as well. Uh, that's it. Everything um, was covered by Hannah there. So uh, all that remains is to say a very Merry Christmas from all at UEA. Thank you for coming. <laughs>